the alliance includes Bridge Valley CTC, West Virginia State University, Marsh University, Concord University, WVU Tech, the Osteopathic School of Medicine, Bluefield State College, New River CTC, and Mount West CTC. So if you look at a map, we're really Mason County, Webster County, Pocahontas County down, and we have about 30,000 students in our footprint. And we've had a really busy year, like most of you. We're very project-based. The Alliance, where we're participating in our annual business leaders survey uh, that's gonna go live later this month. We have a West Virginia Collegiate Recovery Network led by our coordinator, Susan Mullins that we started the 40 top virtual roundtable series, which has allowed us to connect to 1,200 people since April, linking experts directly with West Virginians in a time of the pandemic. And we're gonna continue this uh, in 2021. And of course, it's today's conference is our, uh, is our cornerstone of the Alliance. And we've also started a new statewide student leadership conference, which will be held this Friday and Brad D. Smith is our keynote. Now, for the conference rules. Learn something new. Two, take something back to your community. Make sure you check the schedule on wvsolutions.net. This is your online program book. It has all the speakers' bios. You can customize your schedule. It, it's a great resource, especially for a virtual conference. Our United States Senators will be joining us this morning. So if you have a question for them, please put your question in the Q&A section of the webinar, along with your name and email. Time's very uh, critical this morning and we don't have too much of it. Um, and it's a jam packed schedule. So if they can't get to your question, we are gonna package them up and get, and get the questions to their staff for them to answer at a later date. Please remember, that we are here to celebrate. That's what we're here. So please be constructive in our breakout sessions and stay positive. Take a photo and use the hashtag WV Solutions on social media for your chance to win a $25 gift card throughout the conference. Let's highlight our state and get people talking about West Virginia this week. Just a reminder that each session is being recorded for future reference. For those of you who are wanting uh, continued education sessions, please remember to put your name and email in the Q&A section or the chat section. That's how we're taking roll. And um, we're here to learn this week and we're here to have a little fun too. So let's get started. I first like to call on Brandon Dennis and the Coldfield Development to give some opening remarks. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, it's really happy to be here and to be having this happen. I, you know, you thanked everybody but yourself. Uh, so I, there's a lot of people that have worked hard to make this happen, but nobody's worked harder than you have. And you've just done an amazing job to pull this together under some pretty difficult circumstances. So thank you, Sarah, for, for your leadership. I, uh, as we look to get started, there are two words, uh, two phrases I learned this year that I had not heard before that I wanted to share because I felt like they might be relevant. Um, the first phrase that I learned is something called compassion fatigue. And this is a common phrase in, in uh, like healthcare or mental health services. And it's common for a lot of people who, who work in sectors that are trying to help. Um, a, a certain fatigue can set in after, after time where you're just, you become tired of of caring so much and you sort of feel yourself starting to go to go numb. And I feel like that's not a phrase that I'd heard, but I, I did connect with it. And I think especially during a, a pandemic, so many of us are just feeling tired of, of being tired <laughs> uh, and, and, and maybe feel ourselves, uh, you know, going numb on, in some circumstances. The issues feel so big. The problems feel so overwhelming. And so I think this conference is a chance to put things in perspective, to realize that a lot of good work has happened and is still happening, and to realize that we're not alone. I think those of us that are trying to work to make this state and this region a better place, um, 
it, it's okay to, to, to grow tired. It's okay to grow weary. But that just means it's time to take care of ourselves and, and take a break and catch our breath. Uh, but then rally it and get right back in the ring to, to keep at it. So hopefully this conference serves to, to help us all not burn out, uh, to feel inspired and reinvigorated and, and, and ready to catch our breath and then get back in the ring and, and keep fighting for the causes that we know are so important for our state. The other term that I learned this year that was really interesting was proximate leadership. So this is an idea in, in the study of, of leadership and community development that the people closest to the problem are the best positioned to be the leaders on the solutions to overcome those problems. Proximate leadership. And it, it just, it was a phrase I'd not heard of before, but it immediately connected and, and made a lot of sense to me. And I think it's, it's really relevant for this, for this conference that if you are experiencing a, a problem or pain or suffering right now, uh, we want to acknowledge that, but we also want to ask ourselves, how can we change that pain into our power to become leaders and, and, and solution makers and, and, and solution finders and problem solvers? And so um, I think that, that it's possible. It's not easy, but it is possible to take the pain and the suffering that, that we've had in our lives and to turn that into a very unique power to, to do good. And, and the closer we are to the problems, the better position we are to figure out those problems and to lead, to lead a new path forward. So that's what this conference is all about, it's about solutions. It celebrates all of you and the hard work that you're doing. Uh, and we learn from each other and we, and we move forward stronger than before. Um, so this is gonna be a really exciting couple days. And it's my pleasure now to pass to someone a leader in, in our community and a problem solver who I have tremendous respect for and admiration, and that's Stephanie Tyree uh, with the West Virginia Community Development Hub. Stephanie, the floor is yours. Thanks, Brandon. I appreciate that. Good morning, everyone. I'm Stephanie Tyree, the Executive Director of the West Virginia Community Development Hub. The Hub is passionate about small communities, which is why we're excited to be part of the team for the Small Communities Big Solutions Conference each year. We think that small communities are the heart of West Virginia and they are what makes West Virginia special and makes West Virginia work. The Hub is also passionate about solutions that come from these communities. I love the idea of proximate leadership. That's exactly the way that we approach our work and the way that we think that the best work happens. We think leadership that bubbles up from communities that's led by diverse and often unexpected community leaders is what makes big solutions happen. I love this conference because it looks at all the different ways that solutions relate to small communities, everything from education to workforce development to community development, which we work on. And all of those things matter. So I want to echo Brandon's appreciation of Sarah and Brittany and the team that went into making this conference happen. For those of you that have participated in previous years, normally we're all squeezed into this room together and there's a lot of energy and excitement and we're always a little amazed at how many people come to this event, especially bright and early on a Monday morning. Um, and this year we're joining each other in a different way. But there's still lots of energy, lots of things that are going to happen over the next five days with this event. And what I want to especially give a shout out to is the power of performance awards. This is always the sort of special heart of the Small Community Big Solutions Conference for us. And it's a great opportunity for us to shine a spotlight on those proximate leaders all across the state, often ones that you might not have heard of before this event. So stick with us through the next few days, show up for the things that you care about and show up for those awards. And uh, once again, we're just deeply appreciative to be part of this team. And um, thank you, Sarah, and your team for your leadership. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Brandon. Um, those were very thoughtful words. Now it's my pleasure to officially start our morning program and turn the podium over to U.S. Senator Shelley Moore Capito. Senator Capito is the first female United States Senator in West Virginia's history. She has a great staff with Mary Elizabeth 
Marion League for State Champions. Senator Capito serves on the Appropriations Committee, the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee, the Environment Committee, and the Rules and Administration Committee. This, this committee portfolio pushes her into a strong position to create new opportunities for the Mountain State and to fight for West Virginia priorities, jobs, and principles. Senator Capito has high energy and is very compassionate for all West Virginians. She is always on the go, and so it's my pleasure to introduce Senator Capito, who will give us an update on the Mountain State. Senator Wolf. Yes, thank you, Sarah, and uh, thank you so much, you and Brittany, for putting this together. It's uh, it's when I looked through the program uh, last night as I was preparing, I thought, wow, you've got a real powerhouse panels, and uh, I wish I could stay on and listen to all of them because many of these issues we've worked with. Uh, thank you for complimenting my state staff; they are terrific, and uh, Mary Elizabeth and Aaron, and then Todd and Alex, who are my field reps want to stay close to all of you because, um, as you said, the solutions are found at the local level, but sometimes the, so the, the way to get the, to the solutions is, is some help through the partnerships and collaboration that Brandon talked about. So Brandon and Stephanie, thank you for your leadership. I do wish, as Stephanie said, we were all crammed into that room over at Bridge Valley. It, it's always high energy and it's a lot of fun to uh, crack a few jokes and, and to be able to uh, see our vision together. So um, I was just on the Marshall University campus on Saturday for the 50th anniversary of the of the uh, unfortunate plane crash. And the energy on the Marshall University campus is, is palpable. I think the leadership of Dr. Gilbert is terrific. And I know this initiative is part of what he is very compassionate about, uh, along with many, many others. So um, hats off to Marshall for being the lead here and spe spearheading this. Um, boy, since we met last November, our whole world has just turned upside down. I mean, like all of you, I'm trying to figure out what am I going to do for Thanksgiving and who can I see? Well, what can I do for Christmas? And then Charlie and I were even talking about maybe trying to take a vacation next year, which we normally do because we had to skip it this year. You know, you can't even plan ahead for that. So in, in order to try to really do economic development and workforce development and education, it's even more difficult for you all because people are putting a lot of things on hold. Uh, the world of business and the world of education has changed. Uh, it's no longer sitting in a classroom. It's no longer uh, sitting across the table in different areas trying to uh, work on grants or it, it's all Zoom, it's all virtual. And, uh, and, it, and, and I think business practices are gonna change at the same time. So um, I think that's going to be very interesting uh, to see how this has impacted uh, our way of doing business and our way really of, of conducting our lives. Uh, needless to say, there's lots going on in Washington. I'm sitting in my kitchen right now in Charleston, but as soon as I finish, I'm, I'm going to be driving back to, to D.C. for our last week uh, before we break for Thanksgiving. And uh, a part of uh, what we're going to be dealing with is, are we going to have another CARES package? Are we going to have another stimulus package? Well, I think the question is not, are we, but when? Now, if we back up into August and September, I've been a part of a group that says, yes, we need another CARES package. We need to target it towards those who um, most need it. And we need to make sure that we get it out there quickly. But it got all tied up in political um, the political season, I'll say. And, you know, I don't want to cast dispersions, but I've been on the front line saying we need to get this done. Let's go where we agree. And one of the things we agree on is the PPP program, an extension of that, give people a second uh, bite at the apple. Uh, we know that our restaurants and our hospitality, uh, uh, our hospitality business has been way down. Uh, I was just at the airport. I mean, at the airport here, Jaeger, they're, they're still 50% down. Uh, and it's just crawling back now. And, and so there are a lot of folks that are connected to these, uh, to these types of businesses that haven't been able to fully reopen. So a PPP program that gives, uh, the, where you actually demonstrate that you still have loss, so that's a different from the first one, but also it, it goes to um, people who employ 300 or less. The original one was 500 or less. So we're trying to narrow it in onto really those small businesses 
in our communities, and those are West Virginia businesses, our West Virginia communities that can really use some more relief in terms of uh, capital costs, employee costs, and, and all the great things that the PPP program did. And I know you have uh, financial institutions in the audience. I want to hat tip to them. They adjusted quickly to the small business, uh, the SBA loan program that we created in the PPP program. I saw also where you have the workers comp uh, or workers unemployment um, compensation Commissioner Scott on later, uh, hat tip to him. He's worked terrifically with our office to help those individuals because there were so many different types of businesses that weren't eligible before or had different eligibility requirements that, um, that became eligible for unemployment. That's the second phase of a, of a new stimulus package will be some more unemployment compensation with additional, it won't be as much as $600 but it will be additional as to what your regular unemployment would be. And it would still probably be open to individuals or small businesses that are self-employed, et cetera. Um, the other thing is schools. I mean, I'm really concerned, you know, sitting here today and, and Sarah, I know you have, I don't know, is yours, yours isn't in school yet. Not yet, but close. And, uh, you know, young parents, young em uh, employees in, in all different businesses, the stops and starts of whether you're in school, who's going to take care of the kids, how are we going to get daycare? All of these things are really difficult. And are the schools safe? So we had hundred and uh, $110 billion, I think maybe $120 billion in there to help our schools with their safety, with their digital learning, and also, um, and this goes K through 12, but also our universities and colleges as well. Uh, and so I think the schools need help. Daycare and also was part of this. And then as we see this morning when we woke up, we see another vaccine. Moderna has a not, almost a 95% efficacy rate, uh, going to come out in December if the FDA approves. I think that holds great promise as we see these numbers rise. So this is the kind of stimulus package I think we need. We also need to give, I think, the states the flexibility to use the dollars that they already have existing for tax revenues and also extend the date on that so, so that uh, it doesn't expire. So these are the kinds of things that I think you're going to see in a stimulus package. Now, big question. Is it going to come up? Yes, it's going to come up. Uh, it, I doubt it will come up this week, but probably into December. Uh, I think the calculation, again, is probably going to be a political one. Should we, the Democrats uh, will decide, I think, whether they want to go bigger in December or, I mean, excuse me, in January, uh, or do they want to, um, to move forward with a more targeted package. I'm hoping we get the targeted package that doesn't say we can't do another one later, depending on how the economy is going. But I think this will have great impacts on West Virginia. Other things uh, that I think that I'm gonna be working on for sure is uh, of course broadband. Every time I get in front of you all, I talk about my Capito Connect program. Uh, we have a, a uh, um, an auction going on now in West Virginia where we were able to get five local providers that are um, qualified to bid in this auction. This has great promise, I think. Uh, you saw the numbers that, uh, of potential investment on the federal side of over $700 uh, million. Uh, the governor came in, I think, very innovatively, and I, and I want to say thanks to the development office because I, I know they had a hand in this to try to be the backstop for those um, internet service providers to be able to handle those large, uh, large investments uh, of getting um, getting broadband to that last house, that last mile. So I'm gonna to continue to work on this. This to me is, is job number one for, for education, for healthcare, for economic development, for tourism, for, um, for um, uh, telecommuting and all the things that we've seen over the last nine months, highly uh, uh, emphasized as to how very, very important uh, it is to get um, digital connections everywhere. I've been all over the state in the last month. Uh, I was in Barber. Doddridge Heck County has a really exciting project moving on that goes with Zayo, USDA, the school system, and, um, and, and CityNet. And they are going to prioritize that their first, they're going to connect the entire county of Doddridge County, but the first people to get it are going to be the students. And I think that is a wonderful way to say, not, not only do we value the education, but if you get to the students, you're getting to the parents, you're getting to the grandparents, you're getting everywhere else. So uh, I look forward to seeing how that uh, works out. I've also been checking in with Facebook regularly. They're, they're putting the backbone line going up through from the South over into Ohio. 
um, it was really interesting to go out and see how they put that through. I thought it would be some big complicated thing. It's actually quite easy. They're putting it right on the road, uh, on the um, on the right of way of the highway, which again, I thank the coordination of the state uh, for helping with that. But um, so that I think we're going to really be able to leverage that. Uh, as we know, Facebook needs some good news and what better news than bringing broadband to rural America. Um, but there's all kinds of other things, EDA funding, which has gone up 770% over the last five or six years. Um, and then of course the Virgin Hyperloop announcement, I think just really lifted the entire state. Uh, I think Southern West Virginia can benefit from this. Our office has already received calls from people who say, look, I can participate in the manufacturing. I've been, um, uh, I've been working uh, with the, in the coal mining industry. It's going down, but I have the fabrication abilities to be able to help fabricate the next generation tra transportation system. So I think West Virginia snagging that is such a feather in our cap because that says not just can we compete against everybody, which it does say that, but it says to our young folks and our uh, innovators and our tech community, listen, we're, we're, gonna, we're getting invested in our state uh, to grow an industry that's really cutting edge and we're going to need all the education, uh, all down the whole workforce, uh, uh, up and down the line to be able to capitalize on this. So I'm very excited about that. Um, and then lastly, I'll just talk a little bit about my Girls Rise Up program. I think I talked about it before, and I know one of the questions is, um, what do I tell families and how do they cope? Well, I'm not sure I have great advice there, but I can, I can, I, I do want to talk about the program, and this is my Girls Rise Up Sarah mentioned I was the first, I am the first um, woman to be elected to the U.S. Senate, and I'm very grateful for that, and I'm grateful to be going back for another six years, so I'm excited about that. But I picked the fifth grade girls. For those of you who've ever had young girls in your family, you know that fifth grade is probably the tipping point before they stop talking and they stop listening. Not, they listen, but they don't talk so much. But fifth grade girls have talked. And so I'm trying to inspire them to that next generation of I can do it. Uh, I need to stay healthy. I need to be educated. I need to have confidence. And what does that mean? And so I've brought some really fascinating guests into the classroom. Nikki Haley, who was governor of uh, South Carolina, um, ambassador to the UN. I had one of the most prolific spacewalking uh, astronauts. Uh, uh, Peggy Whitson came in. We went to um, Wetzel County and up into Ohio County. And just recently, we had a really cool one because now we have to do everything virtually. We, with NASA, we teamed and we did a STEM program with the girls and they all, some of them actually came into the building, even though they were not in school that day, but they came into the building with their teachers and they were able to ask, and we got them up to ask the, their, uh, their questions to uh, astronaut Laurel O'Hara, who actually hasn't been in space yet. She was in uh, Russia when she was talking and we had to head the NASA administrator and it's pretty cool because yesterday they had SpaceX took another four astronauts up yesterday. I just think the whole avenue of space for us really opens up exciting probabilities for not just girls, but I think it is it because they're going to put a woman on the moon with, with the Artemis project. And it would be great if, if West Virginia girls could see that and get inspired. So I'm, through, I'm trying to do what I can do for future generations. Um, Moving forward, you know, we don't know right now. I, I get tired of saying I don't know, but the honest truth is I don't know. We don't know who's going to have the majority in the Senate. We have two more Senate races in January. I am so glad that I'm not running in that, and I'm sure Joe's glad he's not running in those either because they're going to be very high stakes. Um, just to frame it out, um, the Republicans have to win one of those to retain the majority. If the Democrats win both of those, then they get the majority, and that determines who the who the um, chairman is, who the what what policy agendas you go forward. So it has very very huge uh, ramifications uh, for our state and really for the entire country. But um, just for you all to know where I will be in my uh, assignments coming up in the next con in the next Senate. I will be the ranking, the lead Republican on the Environment and Public Works Committee, which is exciting because we have to do another highway bill, which is going to be coming through that committee. So depending on if we have the majority, I will be the chair. If we, uh, we being Republicans, if Republicans lose the majority, I'll be the ranking um, member on that committee. So I think that's going to have 
great ideas for us to do the collaborative partnership uh, aspects of um, the Big Solutions Small Communities concept. Uh, I am your partner. I am not, I don't have all the solutions. You guys have the solutions. I need, need to help you get those solutions through the maze of federal government, the, through the maze of, uh, of explaining certain things um, that, and, and my, my team wants to be that help. So please don't help, hesitate to call me. And uh, I look forward to what comes from this discussion. And uh, I'm always very privileged, Sarah. Thank you very much for thinking of me. And uh, I'm happy to answer a question or two. If you, if you had one, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Sure. Thank you, Senator. Well, we do have a couple questions. Okay. One, one that's coming in is um, looking at next year, 2021, what do you think the biggest threat facing the United States is? Well, I think, you know, sitting here right now in this, obviously it's going to be getting a hold of COVID. As we see, as it, certainly the first six months, as we see what's uh, the infection rates going up, um, the uh, the possibility of the deployment of the vaccine, that's got to be done. The deployment of the vaccine is going to be critical the first December, January, February. We know not everybody's going to get it. It's going to go to older people. Apparently, we are, we're going to have enough dosages to, to give to everybody in a nursing home or assisted living, which is great because they're at very great risk, but also our frontline workers, as you mentioned, thank you for them and everything that they've done. So I think in the short term, that's the most important thing. I do think we're going to have, uh, you know, if the administration changes, which it, it, it appears as though that's what's going to happen, and, and we have a new president, I think that's going to be setting an agenda that is, is, is going to be set through the year. But I think an infrastructure package, I mentioned a five-year package, I think something that's big with broadband will be coming through, and, um, and then there's always the unexpected that you can't predict. But I think uh, I think we, I mean, I'm an eternal optimist, as you know. I think we have great things ahead of us, and uh, we're going to be able to work across the aisle and get things done. Um, uh, and so I look forward to that. Okay, and then I have another question. Mm -hmm. Will PPP be available to small businesses that employ five or less people? Um, there were businesses who weren't eligible for uh, because they didn't employ enough people, and and do you envision any assistance coming to? Okay, I think that's a really good question. I, first of all, it does include certain businesses that were excluded before, like the 501c6s, which would be your travel and convention bureaus or quasi governmental. Some of those folks were knocked out in the first one. They will be eligible in this one. I, what, what has happened is um, on the ones that have fewer employees, because it was the, the concept of PPP was to keep you connected to your employer, to keep people employed. And, and so it was heavily based on what your payroll is and your forgiveness was based on your payroll. I think we've lowered the threshold for payroll. So I think smaller companies would be more eligible, but I think that's something I need to go back and confirm and but before you're you know you're going to be on and off and on so i'll try to get that out to you here today um at least the way it's been conceived before but i think some people that are heavy on rent or heavy on equipment or heavy on other costs were knocked out enough employees and had to have 65 percent of your cost had to be your um your payroll and small companies that's that hasn't been the case but we did try to broaden it there yep <laughs> okay <laughs> okay and then we have time for one final question um okay any any words inspirational words that you can give to women who are dealing with children being at home trying to work from home just juggling it all you know i saw an article in, a, in the paper i think yesterday or maybe the day before that said more women are dropping out of the workforce and I thought to myself, no wonder. I mean, when you have um, all of the responsibilities of, uh, of working and then your child is learning from home, maybe your child's been exposed and has to quarantine from home. Um, you know, I just don't know how y'all do it. I, I just don't know how you do it. 
I, I just marvel. I have, you know, daughters-in-law and my own daughter. And I think to myself, I, you know, I was fortunate enough that if somebody got sick, I was home. So I was able to adjust my schedule pretty easily when the kids were little. So I would just say, try to focus on the positive. Um, the one thing that I've really appreciated in the last six months that I think maybe we all didn't appreciate uh, before is uh, the joyfulness in close relationships. Uh, I think uh, Brandon kind of talked about it a little bit, but um, my daughter had a baby, our, our daughter had a baby in New York uh, at the end of February. And she came to West Virginia a couple weeks later and quarantined and then stayed for six weeks. And then I happened to be home that um, during that period of time because we were, we were um, not going to Washington at the time. What a joyful thing for me to be able to spend six weeks with that brand new little boy. And I think to myself, all the trials and tribulations, oh, where are we going to get the food? And oh, have we seen anybody? And oh, we're, we're stuck in this house together. Instead, we need to say, wow, I got to hold him for six weeks where normally I wouldn't have gotten to do that because of work and other things. So if you can focus, find the positive thread, I think is, is the best way to do it. We're all sick of Zoom. We're all sick of... Um, not hugging and 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 so I think that um, those moments that you're with your, you know, how how moms I think what moms are really good at is really networking with other with other moms with other women to find those solutions. I did that when I was uh, home with the kids. I remember. Here's the last bit of wisdom I'll tell you. For those who have really small kids, um, like babies, you know, zero to four. I remember when I had the children, they were all packed in together and I had the three of them. And I, I looked at my mother, I was particularly tired that day. And I said, I said, are these the best years of my life? And she looked at me and she said, you better hope not. <laughs> so, so I say there's better, there's better days ahead, you know, just try to do it as a group. Good luck. And, and thanks so much for the opportunity. I see Joe there. Uh, he looks like you're already in Washington, Joe. I haven't, I haven't made it there yet. So you I'm won't here. go speed. You won't go speeding by me today, like you always do. <laughs> no, no, yeah, no, I won't. I, I try to travel. I try to blaze that trail for you. Thank you. you. Fall, there's no danger at all. Yeah, so you can get stopped before I do, right? You know, all the cops chasing me to go by Maryland. No <laughs> all right. I'll see you. I'll see you in a Please few hours. Yeah. Um, be careful. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much. Hi, Brandon. Bye, Stephanie. We appreciate Bye, it. Bye, Sarah. Thank you, Senator Capito. Now it's time to welcome our senior senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin. Senator Manchin prides himself on having, having an open door policy and an open line of, of communication directly to his constituents. He is very accessible and he just loves town halls. Well, I should know because I worked for Senator Manchin and then Governor Manchin for more than 12 years and I planned many, many town halls. Senator Manchin currently serves as the ranking member of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. He also serves on the Appropriations Committee, Armed Services Committee, and the Veterans Affairs Committee. Senator Manchin also has a great team they work very hard for all West Virginians. So now we'll turn it over to Senator Manchin. Welcome, Senator. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Senator, it's always great to be with you. And it's a, a small community. And big solutions is a tremendous, uh, I think it's tremendous success because of your hard work. Brandon and Stephanie, all of you who have worked so hard on this. And I can tell you, it's going to grow bigger and bigger. We're a state of small, of small communities. We don't have one city over 50,000. And there's only one other state in the nation such as ours, and that's Vermont. Burlington's about 42, 43,000. And other than that, they don't have one either. So we only have two states that have this in common. So it's all about the people. So uh, let me tell you, uh, the, the lineup you have here, I've just looked at it uh, from the congressional update between myself and Shelley, which you just heard from. You have a state update coming, which will be great, small business. And then you have uh, uh, workforce development and social enterprises. So there's an awful lot going on. Uh, so again, to all of you, thank you for all of your hard work. Uh, I know we have many of our college university presidents on here today. Let me thank my good friend, Dr. Gilbert, uh, for chairing the Alliance. Our prayers are with the entire Marshall community, as you know, 
this weekend on the 50th commemoration of the plane crash, which those who are old enough remember so vividly, and it just took an awful lot of wonderful people from us. I want to thank uh, Shelley again. It's just always good to see her and hope she has a, you know, uh, a safe trip back, back to D.C. We need all hands on deck for what's coming up. And finally, thanks for all of you uh, for joining us today. Uh, I wish we could be together in person, but, you know, uh, safety must be our priority in the COVID pand pandemic uh, has affected every West Virginia American. It's changing our daily lives and it's coming back with a vengeance the way it was predicted, uh, impacting businesses and taking 582 West Virginians away from us uh, already. We are at the highest case count per day since the beginning of the pandemic. 1,153 cases on Saturday and 867 yesterday. Uh, I, saw, I really thought that Governor uh, Justice should strengthen the uh, mask executive order. I was glad to see that he did it on uh, Friday. Uh, we must all work together. This is not that great of a, uh, of a hardship for any of us to wear our mask around others in social distance. When we go into a store, I, would, I did not think the burden to be put on the individual, but I can tell you, every business should be responsible and held accountable, allowing anybody in their store or place of business without a mask on, which would be prohibitive, and serving them. Anything they wanted to purchase or come in for whatever ser services they need should have a mask. Once we start that, and we've all forgotten probably one time or another, walked out without our mask on, it makes us conscious. If you're gonna go buy something, you better have a mask. If you're gonna go pick something up or you need some services, you better have a mask. And I think it just makes us conscious until we get through, um, uh, through this pandemic. We're getting great news out of, uh, out of all the uh, manufacturers, pharmaceuticals, uh, coming on strong with 90 to 94% effectiveness. I think it's going to tremendous for a lot of people's minds at ease. We have to gain the confidence of the public again because it's been distorted to where people don't know what to believe anymore. And it's up to those, those of us and those of you all in positions of authority that people are looking up to, to hear the truth, to hear the facts. I've always said this, <laughs> you're entitled to your opinion. You're entitled to think whatever you want to think. You're just not entitled to create your own facts to support what you think, right or wrong. So we've got to get back to facts, fact-based, uh, and also making sure people understand where we're coming from. Uh, if we don't get COVID-19 under control, our business, families, communities are going to suffer, uh, and uh, it's a very small price to pay to ask you to wear a mask until we get through this. I think we're going to be in the first, the end of the first or second quarter before we start seeing mass distribution uh, of the, pan, of the uh, vaccine. Uh, as we work together uh, on the COVID package, I know I heard Shelly talk about the COVID package. Let me tell you where things are and what. Everything today is political. The only thing that wasn't political is when COVID hit us back in March of 2020 this year, we passed two bills immediately, never, never with one dissenting vote. It was unanimous consent because we knew we had to do something quickly. And that was like put a hundred and some billion dollars out the door to try to help stave off the economic impact was going to have. Then we got to the major piece of legislation around a $3 trillion bill. That's when it got a little bit political. And we stopped it for about three days because uh, majority chair, majority leader, Mitch McConnell, basically did not involve any of our input. And we saw hospitals, rural hospitals especially, that weren't getting any, any attention whatsoever. So we put some basically stops on the bill until we were able to get attention to the hospitals and schools and things of that sort that really were going to be left behind and in bad shape. We got that done. Here's the thing that's what's happening is then everybody comes back with a second round. I think that Nancy Pelosi from the House passed a piece of bill, a piece of legislation called the HEROES Act. 3.2 trillion again. Mitch McConnell comes out with what he called the Hills Act in July, which was about 1.1 trillion. And that was in July. We were allowed to go home and we should have never left here until we got the second package so you wouldn't have seen the economic downturn or the challenges. But he sent us all home. He comes back in 1st of September and changes his 1.1 Hills bill to the skinny bill down to 500 billion. It wasn't based on, well, we don't have that much need now. It was based on how many Republicans could he get to vote for anything? So he skinnied it down to the position. That's where the politics 
and I'm not picking on one side or the other. He's in control. He sets the agenda, and that's how the change is. Well, then that infuriated Democrats are saying, wait a minute, you're not dealing in good faith. If the Democrats on the House were at 3.2, he was going to start at 1.1. You don't go backwards to 500 and think you're going in good faith to get something accomplished. That's when it really got contentious. So we got to get back on track now. And if that's all he's going to do, what can we do? And, he'll, and, and Shelley was right in identifying that there's some things we can agree on. What we can't agree on is the language he put in. In that little skinny bill he has, he has language that gives total immunity from any liability or responsibility for the COVID up until 2024. I think anybody in any healthcare provider and anybody that's uh, because of the effect of coronavirus should have immunity until we get a distributed vaccine commercially, or at least until the end of 2021, but not a free pass, if you will, until 2024, there's no need. If we don't have a vaccine by this year and totally commercially distributed, we are in one serious, serious, serious economic free fall. And that won't happen. We'll get there. So that's one thing. The other thing he put in there was a tax, another tax break for people who basically send their children to private schools. And a lot of the people in the high end areas and in, in, in large, uh, large metropolitan areas, it's very, very expensive and they're very well to do. He's allowing them to deduct all their expenses for primary and secondary education against their taxes, which basically takes more tax dollars away from public education. And that's been a real stumbling for West Virginians and for uh, Democrats. Those are the two things. If we can clean up some language and look sincerely, if that's all he's going to put on the table, let's clean it up and make sure it's targeted. That's where we're going on that. And I wanted you all to know that we've got to get past this. And I'll talk a little bit about the political situation we're in right now because I've never seen anything what we're what what we all and you, some of you younger people in your lives, if you read your history books, never in the history of our country in 240 years have we ever seen anything like what we're going through. Uh, in 2019, uh, we had uh, the overdose overdose deaths. I don't need to tell any of you all in West Virginia that this is, is this is an epidemic proportion. Um, in 2019, there were 70,980 reported deaths from overdoses. That's passing the 70,699 deaths in 2017. Uh, the overdose deaths in West Virginia are continuing to rise. It's heartbreaking and acceptable, and our fellow West Virginians need help. Another report projects that 75,000 Americans are at risk of overdose, death, or suicide due to COVID-19 the pressures that come from COVID-19. And West Virginia is at the top for the potential per capita rates of deaths. This is what we're dealing with. Every West Virginian has seen the impact of drug epidemic and devastation it's caused across our state. Working to fix this crisis has been one of my top priorities as Senator. I propose a number of pieces of legislation to combat the drug epidemic in West Virginia and the rest of this country. The Crisis Care Improvement and Suicide Prevention Act would address the crisis by providing increased funding for crisis care services, including call centers, mobile services, and stabiliz stabilization programs. This is especially important during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, where traditional health care services are harder to obtain. The Lifeboat Act, do you know how I've been trying for three or more years to pass Lifeboat? You know what it says? For all the manufacturers that produce opiates, they pay one penny per milligram. You know you're putting something out that's addictive. So at least give us the resources that we can fight it. And that's all we've asked for. Can I get one Republican to sign on? They say it's a tax increase. I says it's a life-saving provision. There's not one of you that have not been affected. I'm hoping now with a more divided, but a very, very closely divided Congress, we can get people crossing over that aren't afraid of the pushback. I'm, I told every Republican, I'll come and campaign in your district with you because there's nobody that should vote against you because you're making a pharmaceutical who is putting deadly opiates on the market because the FDA allowed them to do it. And just to pay one penny so we can have more uh, centers around to help people, this is all we're asking for. We need more treatment centers. We need them all over our state. And uh, we're gonna be fighting for that. 
I have another bill that we did pass, which is protecting the, uh, is uh, Jessica Grubbs Legacy Act, which was signed into law this year. And that act will save lives by making sure medical providers don't accidentally prescribe opiates to people recovering from substance disorder like Jessica. And all it really does is when they, you go in, they say, are you allergic to penicillin? And they mark your chart. We're gonna say basically, have you been addicted? Are you addiction? Are you recovering? Boom, boom, boom. So you're not gonna be prescribed as you exit that hospital or discharge with something that might take your life. Um, infrastructure, I heard you talking about that and asking. Let me tell you one thing. I have been harping about infrastructure for the last three presidents. I thought Barack Obama should have done something to unite our country, which was divided. Him coming in as the first African-American, anything he did was going to be divisive or looked upon as far as what side you're going to take. I have said there has never been an infrastructure bill that I've seen Republicans and Democrats fighting against saying, I don't want this or don't want that. If you've got a bad road, if you've got potholes, if you've got a bridge falling down, it doesn't care if you're a Republican or Democrat. It'll bust your tire, tear your car up, and maybe ruin your whole day with a bridge falling down. So let's fix things. And on top of that, uh, I can't tell you more about the, the whole uh, connectivity. We have seen through COVID the disconnect that we have when we don't have broadband and high speed to every West Virginia. If you think back in the 1930s, probably your grandparents didn't have electricity if they lived in West Virginia, in rural West Virginia. And FDR comes in and basically we have the whole thing that's going to be connect. It's, it's rural electrification. We didn't do it because we forced every utility company to go up every holla and every little nook and cranny because they would lose money connecting three people when it cost them so much. We did it with rural co-ops and we have the footprint to do it. But let me tell you good news. You just saw where SpaceX put astronauts in, in yesterday, right? They put four astronauts up to the space station. You're going to see very rapidly an opportunity that we may have to connect rural America, rural West Virginia. And it might not come from uh, hard wire. It might come from space. I'm very encouraged. You have not said anything about it. We've been working very diligently. The United States has been using uh, low orbit satellites for some period of time now, making sure they work in rural areas. It might give us another opportunity to quickly connect. And if that does until we get the hard wire there and be able to really connect up and make sure that everyone is connected, it might give us an opportunity. There's so many things that we need to do, but without that, you don't have rural, uh, rural education. You don't have kids going home, can't connect and have to go back and drive and sit in front of the school to connect with their homework. You don't have telemed telehealth. You don't have veterans and elderly who can't go to their doctor's visit, but can't have telehealth to get the quality of care they need. We weren't even been able to reimburse our doctors for phone services. So I had to get a waiver from, uh, from uh, DHHS to says at least pay them for the same amount of time they're spending on the telephone that they would if they had connectivity. It's not the doctor's fault and not the patient's fault. So some of these things we work trying to correct. There's so much going on. And let me just tell you uh, about the things that we're doing. My friend Lisa Murkowski is chairman right now of the uh, Energy and Natural Resources Committee. I'm the ranking member. If the Democrats would take uh, control and have the majority, I'll be the chairman. Uh, but we'll just see. But whenever we work well together, we have worked on a bill uh, that's unbelievable. Uh, and uh, the one thing I wanted to touch really quick on, Sarah, very quickly for all of you, We've been fighting the maps, okay? And I want to thank all of you. We've had over 2,000 people send in their own speed testing for, for internet connectivity. And we have been able to stop the chairman of the FCC from sending out $9 billion. And what he calls rural, uh, rural connectivity. The rural connectivity basically are saying that most of West Virginia was connected. We had spots that weren't. They said we qualify for $760 million. There is so much that's not connected because of the maps have been so flawed. We're correcting those. And we held $9 billion until they're corrected. We had to invest $68 million, $68 million to correct the maps. With the maps corrected, we're gonna have more money directed right to West Virginia and rural connectivity will be more of a reality. I'm hoping that we're able to do on this reverse auction, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping some of our companies will be successful in that. Uh, 
So we've been working on that. The thing that I want to talk to you about really quick is what opportunities we're going to have um, with uh, energy. The markets are changing. It's not the fault of anybody. They want to blame all politicians and this and that. It's not the fault. What happens is basically the, the cheap amount of gas that's come onto the market replaced coal, which became a little bit more expensive. And so what happened, people went to the cheaper form. And that's changing. We have both. We've been luck lucky with both of those. But uh, as we develop this new plan, we have a piece of legislation that we put together. It's the Energy, uh, the Energy Innovation Act. In this act, we haven't had an energy policy for the last 12, 13 years. And we're going to be working on that in order to basically make sure that every part of our energy sector is looked into and how we make it better. We're not for elimination, if you heard what I guess is the new green deal. That's an aspirational belief by a very small percentage. Uh, that is not doable. It's not even feasible because you, first of all, we all have to agree. You have to be energy independent in this country to have the country that we have, to have the superpower of the world. You can't be dependent on foreign energy to keep us running. And that's something we're not going to do. Uh, so with that, I've said we have a piece of legislation that has 72 senators have co-sponsored pieces of legislation. 53 bills are in this legislation. It is unbelievable. It goes through everything through A to Z. It makes sure that we invest in technology, that we do more and more research. We're talking about the 48 QC, which is our tax credits that will go more to rural and help rural areas that we can. I've told them this. If you invest your tax credits that you're allowing people to use as we develop more energy and newer forms of energy, make sure those tax credits are used in areas of lost energy jobs. So in Southern West Virginia, we'll build you the best windmill. We'll build you the best solar panel. We'll build you the best energy sources that are coming on market, whether it's fusion or hydrogen, whatever it may be. And we'll also build you the best technology of carbon capture, sequestration, utilization to be used around the world. Fossil fuels are going to be used whether you like it or not. If you're going to use them, use them in the cleanest possible fashion. West Virginia can lead the charge on that. That's what this bill is all about. We put a tremendous amount of resources towards this, which should be very, very, very attractive and helpful for our state because we're making people go to West Virginia. If you want these tax credits, go into the states that had the greatest job losses. Go into the states that lost the coal mines and the coal jobs and the ancillary jobs that go with it. We've got the people. They just want to live where they want to live. And can't they do that? If we can direct some of this, we're still accomplishing the same goal. And that's what it's all about. And that's what we should be doing. Also, the Hyperloop. I'm so excited about the Hyperloop. I think it's a great testament. And everybody worked together. This was an all hands on deck. This is the way it should be. From those of us who represent on the federal level, I was very happy a year ago, I wrote letters to Richard Branson spoke to all their team, they came into Washington, and all the job that, that was done in state, Ed and Mike and all the people that will be talking to you later, everyone did a great job, jumped forward, and I mean, it wasn't about politics, who gets credit. It was the state of West Virginia that gets the credit for this. Now we just got to perform, and we will, we'll make everybody proud. There is so much going on right now, gang, in the political world, I don't know where to start, but I can tell you this. We are the country we are because of the rule of law that we have that no other country has. Madam Justice has blindfold, and the blindfold on every courthouse almost has her, that statue, her holding the scales and the blindfold. You cannot take the blindfold off. The rule of law is what we are and who we are and why we are what we are, but the bottom line is the orderly transfer of power is the most important thing that we have ever done to establish ourselves as a democracy that we are for 230 plus years and it has to continue. Doesn't matter, West Virginia voted overwhelmingly for Republican and Republican uh, President Donald Trump, but the nation did not. There is no fraud that we can find anywhere. Even Republican Secretary of States, Republican prosecutors have said there's no fraud. No one was blocked from observing. Republican judges have turned down baseless claims. There is no evidence. And yes, the president does have the right to continue to use all his legal options. 
what he hasn't does not have the right to jeopardize democracy as we, as we know it in the way the world sees it. He doesn't have that right. Nobody has that right. And my Republican colleagues and friends have to speak up. More of them have to speak up. But we recognize that there is a president-elect. That could change. But we have a president-elect, which has always been recognized during this period of time as we're going through the canvassing. But I've got to be honest with you, when I see the rallies and see the president invoking this type and instilling this type, this is not who we are. It's not America. And people have to speak out. You have to. If you're a Republican, please be an American first, which I know you are. I know West Virginians believe deeply. But this conspiracy theory has got to stop. We've got to continue to, 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 to move on. And I made this commitment. You've heard it on national news. I will not vote to break the filibuster. I will not do, vote to get rid of the filibuster. If we have a 50-50 tie, that means one Democrat that does not vote to do something that, let's say, the majority of the Democrats in the caucus want to do, it doesn't happen. The Vice President Kamala Harris has no tie to break because there is not a tie. And I've told people, well, take that fear off. I'm not voting to stack the court. I believe the court can operate. And I believe it has. When you put good qualified people on, no matter if they might lean left or lean right, they put that robe on for lifetime. I'll guarantee you, they usually rise to the occasion. And you'll see that happen. And I've got confidence and faith in that. And once you start stacking the court, you put three on here, the next administration comes in, where does it stop? That doesn't work. It hasn't worked and it shouldn't work. I think nine is fine. It's worked well for us for many, many years. So those types of things there and all these aspirational things and people. Social media has done so much to advance so many good things in America and around the world. And it's been used as a platform to spread hatred and discrimination across America and across the world. Don't let that enter into us. We've got to fight back. And there's got to be a factual and then people like yourself who are leaders in your communities and leaders in your profession, please speak out. Don't be afraid to tell the truth as you know it based on the facts as they are presented and been verified. That's what I would say to all of you. So if there's any questions, I, I'm, I'm proud to be a West Virginian. I'm proud of everything that we all do. And I'm proud of work ethic and our veterans and everything that we've done, the military services. Our National Guard has always been number one in the nation continues to do that and lead the charge. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll come back together. We have to. It's time. The country wants us to come together. More than anything else, they want us to work together, I can assure you. And we'll continue to try to do that. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Senator. We are getting a couple questions. Sure. Froze up, Sarah, here. We'll get it going here in a minute. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. So, um, seniority in the Senate. What rank are you and why is that important? Can you talk a little bit about that? I uh, I was 43, so I guess I'm 40, maybe 41 now, since two uh, two people have been two games. So I would say maybe they're 40 or 41. And seniority does play. play you know, does, seniority is the reason I'm ranking member in energy and natural resources, okay? Uh, the, the, the Republicans do it a little bit different than seniority. They move things around depending on the person runs and what your position was before. Shelley coming into the Senate with her uh, house, that, that worked her seniority being in a federal position, worked for her. That was very helpful for West Virginia. Me being a governor before I came in was helpful for me. Out of 100 members moving up as quick as I have in seniority. But the bottom line is, is that, that Every senator, the power of a senator is unreal, what the founding fathers have given us. But basically, it's been abused. It's basically been used to, to give the minority the input. If you do a way, so you understand the system, how it works, the whole purpose is this. Two senators for every state, no matter how big or small. What's the purpose of that? Rhode Island has the same as California. What's the purpose of that? Rhode, uh, Montana? With 700,000 people, has the same as New York. What was the purpose? They wanted an equality that there would be a voices would be heard and no one be left behind. What's the purpose of electoral college? Showing that you have wide disbursement of support, not just pockets of support. That was the purpose of it. What was the purpose of giving us a filibuster to stop anything? It was the purpose to give the minority input. 
So in this in the House, it's strictly super majority. I mean, simple majority. 218 votes. You can steamroll the other side and pay no attention. They got no input and they can't stop you. On the Senate, you might have 51 Democrats or 51 Republicans that are controlling it, but I'll guarantee you the other 49 or whatever have a tremendous amount of input to stop and say, oh, wait, don't forget me. Let me tell you what's happening in West Virginia that you're not considering. This is why we're not going to go until we see if there's more people in rural America getting left behind like we think we are. You do away with that, and there's no reason for bicameral. There's no reason for George Washington to say and, and explain, and him and Jefferson, the reason we have bicameral, they looked around the world, they looked back in history trying to get something they thought would truly work, and, and, and the people would have input and controlled by the people. And it simply works this way. The bicameral works because the House is always a hot. If the Democrats take over, they've got a certain agenda. Republicans take over, they got a certain agenda. If the liberals or conservatives on each side, they got a certain agenda. When it comes to the Senate, it's supposed to be like taking that hot cup of tea, cooling it off and saying, eh, they went a little bit too far on that one. No, that don't make sense. And cool it off. We're going to have no cooling off, period, or cooling off place. And the Democrat, I mean, in the Democrat democracy that we have, the Senate is the most deliberate body in the world for a reason. It was designed that way. And that's why we've had the longest lasting democracy in the world. So I hope that with seniority, we can use that. And I've told him, I will not vote for this craziness. I am not going to be a partake in dividing this country further. Looking at a um, Democratic president coming in and, and with that administration um, changeover, what department, what agency are you looking to bring in in 2021? Have you get given that much thought yet? When you say bring in, what do you mean by bringing in? Like visiting West Virginia. To, to no, I mean, there's two, two agencies that affect every state, commerce and energy. Because basically we all need jobs. We need an economy that works. And we need energy that basically fuels the economy that we're trying to make sure provides the, the opportunities. Uh, other than that, education. Are we basically using the best talents we have in our educational system to make sure they're designed towards the jobs that we should have in West Virginia? Are we building our economy around the, around the, the, skills, the skills that people have? Are we actually providing the skill sets that are needed? You know, uh, I think we need to look at everything we have. How many children are we leaving behind? We have more of a challenge now than we've ever had before. How do you get children? We get more homeless children than ever before. We have a whole, you know, we have less children right now that the whole funding mechanism of education funding in West Virginia is going to change because of the lack of students that we have and the loss of students. How do we take advantage of these opportunities? The difference thing, West Virginia can do this. We can, you know, uh, I'll give you an example that I that I understand talking to John Chambers and Brad Smith and them. Palo Alto is losing a lot of people. California is basically run a lot of people off. Just look around at Arizona, look at Nevada, look at all the states that have been gaining population, close proximity to California. But that brain trust is leaving Palo Alto. These are people that love to have outdoor hiking and biking and rafting and climbing and everything that we have. We've got to baby, attract them. Virgin Hyperloop gives us the first, it gives other people, wait a minute, if Sir Richard Branson and Virgin Hyperloop would consider what, what did they see that we haven't seen? Because all they're hearing about the stereotype. There's more to us than that. We've got to take advantage of that. And we've got to get up and running as quick as we can. And the STEM, I mean, STEM education, everything that we do, has got to be directed towards that. But we have an awful lot going on. And, and you know, with, look what you all been able to do at Marshall right there, basically with, your opportunities in, 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 in uh, aviation and aeronautics and also in transportation. It's all part of the same. And you all find a niche there. I think you want to fill that niche. I, I, I applaud you for And we should be doing more of that. Well, and, and that leads us to the next question. Um, you know, you've got the Senate um, the state uh, create more jobs uh, in regards to economic and community development? Well, let me just say in higher education. Higher education is the economic engine in most areas where they are. So if you're going to take a college out of Glenville or out of Athens, 
there is an economic void we can't fill. And people better come to realization, the investments we make in higher education is the investments we're making. Now, what higher education better do is do like you all have done. Okay, aeronautics, you found a niche. They need pilots. We need people. Aviation is coming back. Okay, so you're going into that. Allied services, healthcare, nurses, all this, dentistry, different things that we should be doing. If you're not looking at basically in your surrounding area and what areas you service and where Brandon is right there and what he's trying to do down, if they're not looking at how do we assist them be successful, how do we get some of these people that lost their jobs and have more talent? We never tapped it. They never even knew they had the talent they have, but they do. Let me tell you, you can't put a person under mine and say survive and thinking those people aren't, don't have some ingenuity to them, that they can adapt to anything you throw at them. And Brandon, I think you know I'm correct on this. You can throw it to them, they'll grab it like a sponge and adapt to it. The thing about it is we got to get people up, up, up off their butts and start thinking they're, they're, they're better than what they are, or they've hit bottom and they can't pick themselves up. You got to push them. And this is where you got to be tough love. And I've said this, you know, we have, we all, with our children and how you were raised as a, as a child, your mom and dad didn't treat you all the same. There was five of us. They pick and choose where they had to put more effort. They already had some self-starters. They had some that were needed jump started every morning. And they pushed it because they saw the potential. I see the potential in West Virginia, but I guarantee I'm not going to be easy on them. I'm going to be hard on them. They got to get up and go. And I got to show them there's a way to make it. And that's why I'm saying bring attention. This is where I fell out with, with President Obama. I said, you're going to renewables. You have a right. I says, I know the market's transforming. I understand that. But can't you at least make the people that are basically taking advantage of the tax credits to use them or the people that basically carried the weight for 100 years deserve to have an opportunity? We got no response on that. And that's what hurt. But we're back on And I talked to Joe Biden's team. They basically will invest, will invest heavily in areas that basically did the heavy lifting for a long period of time and got nothing in return. There's been a little bit of dribbling coming in. You've all been able to grab a little bit of money, but not enough to make a difference. We got $4 billion going to <clears throat> Debbie Stabenow from Michigan and myself. Debbie wants, you know, she's trying to reinvigorate the auto industry. I'm trying to reinvigorate coal country that lost coal jobs. So any, any area where a coal mine closed, we're going to be able to have resources going right to that area to attract businesses to come in, to take advantage of tax credits, and also give them startup money to come into an area that has been deprived of any economic opportunity. That's big time. That's big time. That can happen. Well, and Senator, uh, we'll, we'll finish on this one last question. Um, you've hosted several town halls over the past few months with faith leaders talking about uh, social justice uh, issues. And, and can you talk a little bit about what um, you discussed in those town halls, what, uh, what have you heard from West Virginians and um, uh, during those conversations? Oh boy, that's a tough one there, Sarah. There's so much. I mean, you know, I've always, when I was governor, I was I try to bring the faith community together. Basically, you know, when all this, uh, when the, all the terrorists, you know, all the different things we went through after 9-11, trying to bring people to understand we're all, we all come from different parts of the world. We all come from different walks of life. We're not all the same. Our color, our skin's not the same. Our religion's not the same. Uh, but in America, we've all been peace-loving, God-fearing. And that's really what it should be, an acceptance of all, this total inclusion. You know, I, this discrimination and and racist type overtures and all that, it's, it's not who we are. It really isn't. And I've said, when you have economic opportunity, economic opportunity transcends all, all type of divides. It really does, especially racial divides or social divides. The person has an opportunity. I remember in Farmington, my goodness, we had every type of denomination you could ever believe because they all come to the coal mines. They all made the same money. They all get the same paycheck. And those types of things, you create, create that and we can change all this. But right now, people thinking, well, they're coming in taking my jobs or this person's taking my jobs. No. But if you want to work hard and get yourself to a skill set to where you have opportunities, that'll be there for you. If not, there'll be other opportunities. And you have to decide what you want and how you want it. But 
the diversity that we have in our state. But basically right now I'm concerned because we have an older growing population. We don't have enough of the youth coming on or enough of, of those in the workforce area. So what do you do? Well, it takes a while to repopulate, but you can sure try. You can attract with incentives to come to our state in different parts of our state because of state and federal uh, incentives. That's what I'm trying to do. And that's why I'm trying to use the federal dollar to say, fine, you can't leave us behind. There's not a state that gave more than our state of West Virginia to have the country we have, the superpower we have, and the success we've had. And we can't be left behind. So with that being said, we got the 48, we got the Q tax credit, 48C Q tax credit coming. We've got basically the extension for the uh, uh, for the tax credits on auto and coal areas, the heavy manufacturing, that'll come in. And also directing basically incentives from, from tax credits. We have, they call them tax extenders, but if we're gonna extend the wind and we're gonna extend solar and we're gonna have extension trying to mature hydrogen and fusion, and if we're going to do extensions as far as giving tax credits to use to come up with carbon capture sequestration utilization so that we can take clear stream carbon and solidify and use it as, as a spent fuel for higher value, all these types of things, why can't you do it in West Virginia? That's all I'm saying. Brandon will find people who can do it. I know he will. <laughs> These found people to do things I never thought they'd do before. And by God, they're doing it. I appreciate it. But all of you, Stephanie, I thank all of you. Thank you so much for what you're doing here. It's really... It's really great being with you. I know you got a tremendous panel set up for you, and I wish I could stay there and listen to him. I'm on Zooms all morning long, and then we vote this afternoon. So thank you. Anything else, Sarah? No, I think that will do it. Thank you so much, Senator Manchin. We appreciate your time this morning. I see Michael there. He's ready to go. Mike's ready to go. Thank you, Mike. Take over, buddy. I appreciate it. But thank all of you. Let's work together. This is the United States of America, not the divided states. And we are West Virginia. We can show them how to unite. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Take care. Right. Wow. What a great congressional briefing from Senator Capito and Senator Manchin. We thank them and their staff very much for taking time out of their schedule to join us. Mm -hmm. Now we will shift our focus and get a state update from West Virginia Development Office Director Mike Green. Mike is always working. Before his appointment by Governor Jim Justice, Mike spent most of his professional career as an executive or co-founder founder positions with companies related to the petroleum industry. In those roles, he was responsible for managing different facets of business, including acquisition, maintenance, construction, finance, administration, retail operations, and environmental compliance. Director Graney, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's a pleasure to have you on. Sarah, thank you very much. Um, I very much appreciate the opportunity to, um, to share some thoughts. Um, you know, I grew up in a small town in Southern West Virginia, so this is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, Mount Hope, West Virginia, population 1,200. You know, the last two years has been fascinating for me. I've learned a tremendous amount. And um, I will tell you that it's not so easy to follow our, our, sen our senators uh, in a presentation, but what's actually unique is much of what they shared with us is actually the same voice um, across many different parts of our state. We're all speaking with the same voice. We're actually, actually cooper cooperating and collaborating. We're not competing. And so I think that's why we're winning is because we're speaking with that one voice. We all sort of want to get to the same point. Um, obviously, the last several months has been uh, difficult for the West Virginia economy, but frankly, the CARES Act and uh, federal stimulus has had an enormous impact on our economy. And, you know, the updates from the governor um, really find us in pretty good shape, particularly as we compare to a number of other states around the country. Uh, many states are facing enormous, um, you know, budget deficits, and and frankly, we're not. And so that's, that's, a, that's a great place for us to be in. Um, you know, as I said, the last two years has been fascinating and working with the development office and the staff here has been uh, very humbling. They are incredibly passionate and uh, they work really hard. And, and frankly, we're really winning right now. Um, you know, the first several months of 
um, this pandemic, uh, we spent really triaging our existing businesses, helping them work their way through the Small Business Administration support, um, matching resources with needs, and we really did focus on triage. Um, along about the middle of June, activity in, in the development office really started picking up in terms of both expansion and attracting new projects. And so we're really busy right now. In fact, a couple of the folks who have been in the development office for years feel like we've nev never been as busy as we are right now. And that's great news for our state. It's fantastic. Thing. We've had a number of you know, great expansions and recent announcements, and we'll have more. You know, obviously Virgin Hyperloop was mentioned, but Mitsubishi Heavy Industries was announced. Pratt & Whitney expansion was announced. Obviously P&G continues to, you know, add more employees and almost build out all of their 41 lines. Um, and it ended up being, you know, three times the investment we had ever anticipated. And frankly, is now probably one of the most sophisticated manufacturing facilities in the world. Not just the United States, but in the world. And it's, it's, it's awesome. Uh, we have more great announcements uh, coming. In fact, um, one today at one o'clock and another one on Wednesday at one o'clock. Both great projects that are, that are really exciting. Um, you know, just to talk a, a, another moment, I know the senators both re referenced Virgin Hyperloop, but to talk a mo another moment about it, I, I don't think we can even fathom the impact to our economy and to our education system the Virgin Hyperloop will have over the next many decades. And you know, the long game here is obviously in the manufacturing, the subassembly, and the knowledge that will be gained. And we're really going to you know, be working on revamping, you know, training up people who can work in those facilities. K through 12, the CTCs and the four-year universities will all be working and collaborating together um, on that. You know, certain regions in West Virginia, frankly, are on fire. Uh, the North Panhandle, North Central, Eastern Panhandle, Southern West Virginia, not as much, but the announcement today actually in, in, includes an expansion in Southern West Virginia. So that's great news. Um, you know, tourism and outdoor recreation is, is truly on fire. Many of those uh, entities have been affected by COVID, but um, the, you know, state utilization of the state parks is, is unbelievable. I'm sure Secretary Gosch will talk a little bit about that. Um, Another piece of great news. Last week, Site Selector Magazine positioned West Virginia in the top 25 states to make investments in the country. That's the first time ever that West Virginia has been recognized in the top 25 investment sites in the state. And, and why is that? Because we actually, over the past several years, have created a great business climate. We, we are friendly, we're small, but we're nimble because of it. And you know the, the folks that have had make investments here recently are really, really, really excited to do so for all those reasons. Um, you know, broadband expansion is absolutely critical. The, the development office added a director to the office of broadband to really build capacity so that we can put together a real plan that is actionable. Obviously, there are a number of federal resources that will be available, but we're going to have to change the way we, we, we look at building out broadband. And both, both of the senators referenced this. It, it is absolutely critical. Um, you know, as I said, we, the development office is really focusing on um, a number of very specific areas to do a, attraction and expansion. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the West Virginia NDIA was formed the National Defense Industry Association, really focused on attracting um, defense companies and contractors to the state of West Virginia. Um, that's an important initiative for us. In fact, um, the, both the technology parks, um, the I-79 Technology Park and the West Virginia Regional uh, Technology Park in South Charleston are working collaboratively. Hear that collaboratively. They're not competing, they're working together to attract federal agencies to move to the state of West Virginia. And I'm sure Secretary Ignacio will talk more about that. So I'll, I'll let that. But the point is, is that we're being very intentional about looking for ways to expand our economy. So in the coming period, the development office will focus on the defense sector, the technology sector. Why? Because you know, those folks can figure out how to relocate fairly quickly. Um, they can pick up their laptops and move here and go to work. 
um, we'll also, of course, continue to focus on the petrochemical and polymer um, development in the, in the tri-state area. And finally, we're going to be focusing on a remote worker campaign very intentionally. We have, um, you know, some, some opportunities to work with um, large employment-based organization that uh, we've come in contact with, and it's very exciting. So stay tuned for that. We'll be rolling out a Yes West Virginia campaign. Why Yes? Because if you locate here, you have an immediate cost advantage, an immediate competitive advantage against your competition. We have a lower cost of doing business. We're number six in the country, sixth lowest, you know, cost of doing business in the country. We haven't had a business tax increase in 25 years. We've had, they've lowered instead. Um, you know, we have a, a, a rainy day fund that makes our, our economy very stable. Um, we, have one, we have the second lowest em, um, employee turnover rate in the country. So we have a very loyal work. Once they get trained and have their skill and go to work for you, they don't leave. That's a great message. I mean, um, companies that are looking to locate here want to know that there's talent available, that the workforce is available, and that they'll be loyal so that they'll have a high turnover rate. Um, so we've got a great story to tell. Um, and, and frankly, as long as we're continuing to collaborate and speak with one voice, we're going to win. Um, it, truly, the Virgin Hyperloop win proves that we can compete on a national and international basis with anybody. So, you know, bring it on. We want more opportunities. I'm, I'm uh, you know, incredibly optimistic about our future. And so with that, um, I'm happy to answer questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll let me introduce Ed Gaunch and then maybe we can do questions later if we need to. Does that work, Sarah? Great. Um, so um, Secretary of Commerce, Ed Gaunch, uh, a longtime friend of mine, native of Boone County, incredibly successful businessman with an incredible career. As he shared with me, he got tired of his retirement and decided to get back engaged. And um, you know, was, I was a senator um, for four years and uh, now almost two years as the Secretary of Commerce. Um, it is an honor and a, and a true pleasure to work with Ed Gaunch. Um, so Ed, over to you. Hey, good morning, Mike. Thank you so much. Good morning, Sarah and team. Uh, great pleasure to be with you. I've been looking forward to this opportunity. I'm sorry we can't do it in person, but uh, this is the next best thing. And um, I'm getting good at things like this and I never thought I'd ever get good at it with lots of help from my, my uh, helpers. Um, these are interesting times. We're in um, trying times for sure, but I have to be honest and tell you, uh, I'm more optimistic than I've been in many years about the future of West Virginia in terms of uh, uh, economically, uh, just almost any way I look at it. Um, the disadvantage to going last with these great speakers you've had this morning, our senators and Mike, is that much of what I had to say to you has already been covered. So uh, maybe that'll cut cut down on what I have to say in terms of time. But I. Uh, as uh, Mike said, I, I'm Ed Gunch, I'm the Commerce Secretary. Uh, and most people, when they think of commerce in West Virginia, think of the Western Development Office with Mike Graney, who very capably uh, leads. Uh, but actually, Commerce uh, is, a, is an organization that now has to uh, be responsible for, including the Development Office. Uh, and much of what I say will relate to the Development Office. But there's also the Department of Natural Resource, uh, Tourism, and both of those agencies uh, are just hitting on all cylinders. We've seen an exponential double-digit growth in uh, in our state parks and in terms of uh, camping and uh, uh, lodging facilities, uh, cabins particularly. Uh, we're spending $60 million uh, in the Department of Natural Resources to upgrade our state parks, especially our lodges around the state. Uh, and and we expect uh, that growth to continue. Of course, Chelsea Ruby leads tourism and uh, has just done a phenomenal job. I don't know any other way to say it. Um, in West Virginia, we, we uh, no offense intended, but we finally, I think, have now determined uh, and, 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 and can address
drawn tourism into the fold. And, and everybody understands now that tourism is an industry in West Virginia. Huge potential, huge growth taking place. Um, Re Rehabilitation Services is a commerce agency. Uh, commerce Communications, of course, Miners Health, Safety and Training, Workforce West Virginia, which has had an incredibly busy seven months or so here in West Virginia. Those people have worked uh, triple shifts uh, sometimes. Uh, we've worked around the clock uh, to stay on top of the uh, unemployment insurance situation in West Virginia. And I give those uh, folks in, in uh, workforce incredible uh, kudos because they've just stepped up and done a wonderful job. Then the West Virginia Division of Labor is a commerce agency, the Geologic and Economic Survey, and the Division of Forestry. All of those things are commerce agencies. Uh, and if you get the chance to really think about them, they all make sense as being part of commerce. They all impact uh, commerce, uh, trade, et cetera, in the state of West Virginia. I'm encouraged uh, also because uh, uh, today, uh, this evening, uh, we'll get the new unemployment numbers for the month of October. Um, and I've, uh, I've watched these uh, numbers come carefully. Uh, and I believe uh, that we can uh, truthfully say that the, the recovery that we're experiencing in West Virginia is a V-shaped recovery. Obviously, we don't know what tomorrow's gonna bring or next month, but uh, we've, uh, we've weathered this storm pretty well. And Mike indicated our state finances are in great shape and all those things are really good news. Uh, our unemployment rate uh, for uh, the three months of May, June, July, or four months in August. Actually, we uh, ended up with a lower unemployment rate than the, uh, than the entire United States unemployment rate. And, um, and, it, and I expect the October numbers to come out later today and see little uh, more improvement as we move forward. Um, my job as Commerce Secretary is to cast a vision, I think. Uh, to be more strategic in what I say and, and what I do. And so I've decided today just to talk about three or four initiatives that, uh, that are important to me and I think should be important to the state of West Virginia. Um, and I'll begin, uh, anybody who's heard me speak uh, around the state uh, over these last couple of years has heard me talk about regionalism. Regionalism is so important to our state, I believe. And, we have to understand that, that, that what good, what's good for one county or one area or one town is also good for the, the entire area. So we have to move, I believe, to more regionalism in our economic development efforts, our tourism efforts, um, and even in our governance areas and, and how we govern. Um, so regionalization continues to be a, a big deal to me, I believe a big deal to the state, and uh, we're going to try to uh, do our best to encourage local communities to look to their neighbors to talk about partnerships and regionalization as we move forward. Uh, Mike mentioned the uh, remote worker program, uh, which, uh, which is also uh, an initiative of, uh, of our governor. Uh, we're getting great collaboration on that. Uh, we, we see a program uh, uh, growing up at, uh, at West Virginia University. Uh, a uh, gift of, of, from um, Mr. and Mrs. Brad Smith of $25 million to make that program a reality there. But uh, we've uh, uh, collaborated on that uh, with them. And uh, we think uh, that the, the program through the Western Development Office can greatly complement what's going to happen at WVU. And we'll be working together and sort of separately on those issues. But we think there's a window of opportunity there that uh, folks are starting to see West Virginia as a place where they not only want to visit, but also want to live, work, and play. And uh, we want to make that happen. There's a couple of uh, couple of issues we need to deal with, and we are. One is connectivity, of course. The other uh, is housing. We need to uh, make sure that we want, when we are trying to attract these folks to our state, that we have places for them to live. Uh, third initiative that I'll talk a little bit about uh, is, is uh, more kind of general in terms of creating an environment uh, where business can prosper in our state. Um, 
things like tax policy, the regulatory environment, um, and, and in a sense to, to, to be a catalyst so that these folks who we want to attract to our state can come here, do business, make a reasonable profit, hire West Virginians, and let government then basically kind of stay out of the way uh, unless we're needed uh, for particular uh, for particular issues. And then lastly, uh, well, next to last, um, I, of course, uh, Mike said that he's from Mount Hope. Uh, I'm from a coal camp uh, in Boone County called Ridgeview, uh, born and raised there. I uh, spent the, the first 18 years of my life there, 17 years. Um, and so I have a particular soft spot for Southern West Virginia, especially uh, those um, areas, uh, what, what we tend, tend, tend to call the coal fields. Um, and so uh, one of the uh, emphasis that, uh, that's important to me um, is to create that, that same environment in Southern West Virginia and figure out a way um, to, to let that area prosper like uh, we see so many other areas in the state of West Virginia doing. And one particular thing I'll tease you with uh, a little bit is, is what I'm calling a, an initiative to incentivize coal to products. There's still a lot of coal in Southern West Virginia and we can do many things uh, there in addition, in, in, in addition to uh, mining coal, but there's still coal in Southern West Virginia. Uh, they're not called the coal counties for, for no reason. Um, the coal to products initiative is very, uh, I think, um, uh, critical uh, to the future of, of Southern West Virginia, in addition to um, infrastructure issues in terms of the water, sewer, highways, et cetera. And uh, I've seen, I think you've seen from this administration a particular emphasis on those areas, and I continue to push those every day. But this coal to products initiative, particularly important, I think, because uh, we have uh, two or three real live prospects of uh, businesses that will use coal to transform, the, transform them into other products and uh, almost uh, exclusively with a zero carbon footprint. It's incredibly uh, exciting to me. I hope I live long enough to see that come to fruition. We're moving on that every day. And then lastly, as Mike mentioned, uh, Another initiative is to um, is to uh, work with the federal government, and I've created uh, what I call a federal government relocation task force. There is a move in Washington to move federal agencies out of the Beltway area. We want to make sure that uh, we become uh, available and attractive. We've already been successful in the state of West Virginia, uh, particularly there in that North uh, I-79 corridor, uh, the Parkersburg uh, along the river area. Uh, but uh, there are lots of other opportunities, we think, to get uh, uh, gov federal government agencies to relocate uh, some of some of their particular agency in the state of West Virginia. It's been an exciting you know, almost two years for me. Um, uh, I honestly, as I started out this uh, session saying I'm, I'm more excited than I've been in, at any time in those two years, Mike, uh, said we're going to have two announcements uh, this week of expansions or uh, new businesses coming to the state. I see those continuing. Our pipeline is uh, is growing and uh, we see deals getting closed uh, almost every week. So very exciting, good time to be a West Virginian and I think our future is bright. And once again, Sarah, thank you for including me. Um, and uh, what I'm uh, going to do is turn the program over to Kim Donahue who's the Charleston branch manager for the uh, United States SBA, um, an agency that we work very closely with and uh, uh, have a good relationship with. So Kim, it's all yours. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I'm here for the small business update and I was gonna do some slides, but you know what, let's just, let's just do this. Um, and of course, thank everyone for uh, this opportunity. Uh, from the perspective of SBA's uh, West Virginia District Office, there are um, um, a number of COVID relief programs for businesses that came into effect in uh, March, early April. 
Um, uh, Senator Capito actually mentioned the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, the other that we have seen most movement on has been the expansion of the um, uh, SBA's existing disaster loan, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, and the advance that uh, went along with that. And one that uh, folks maybe not have not heard as much about is um, SBA's Debt Relief Program. But where we are by the numbers is when it comes to the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, West Virginia uh, small businesses received 18,068 um, uh, PPP loans at, for $1.8 billion. It's a lot of cash. Um, and I will say that our West Virginia lenders, uh, particularly those in our smaller communities, they really stepped up. They really did this right, and 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 we are very appreciative uh, for them doing this. Um, because what happened was that um, the the loans were actually made at the local level. The loans were actually made in local banks, and SBA simply provided the framework uh, on the back end and and some on the front end. Um, well, I don't have West Virginia numbers particularly, but I do know that nationally, 27% um, of those PPP loans were made in low and moderate income communities. And, and that's really the uh, and percentage of the, of the population in those areas. 25% um, went to small businesses and nonprofits located in what we at SBA called uh, underutilized, um, historic, uh, historically utilized, under, um, uh, business zones. And then another 15% uh, overall went to small businesses and nonprofits um, located in rural areas. When it comes to the um, economic injury disaster loan, now that's a, that was a working capital loan. Uh, it could include payroll, but it was a little, it, it's, it's more expansive than the PPP was. You could use it for more things. Uh, and but it was a working capital loan for 3.75 percent for small businesses and 2.75 percent for nonprofits. And what we saw in West Virginia was um, uh, 7,943 uh, idle loans for 423,000. Um, well, about 400 and uh, uh, actually 424 million dollars. That, that's that's a better rate. Um, I want to also uh, encourage everyone that um, to know that idle doesn't end until December 31st. So if you uh, know of a nonprofit or for-profit that needs some additional uh, assistance, uh, they can still apply. And so, but we would encourage you to um, read the frequently asked questions on sba.gov or, or just call our office and we can walk you through the process. The third program that we've run across, um, or the, excuse me, that was part of the CARES Act and has um, most people haven't heard a lot about it, but it, probably because it's got a really boring name. It's, it's the SBA Debt Relief Program. And what happened was, is, is if you already had an SBA loan, whether it was a 7A, a 504, or uh, a microloan, uh, you received automatically, you didn't have to apply, six months of payments. Uh, that is, the SBA went in and, and provided to the lender six months of principal interest and fees so that you got some breathing room. Uh, so um, uh, that has been uh, tremendously effective as, as we can see. And of course, um, as um, uh, Secretary Gonch has mentioned, you know, uh, we've actually seen growth uh, our 7A loans uh, at um, uh, $48 million, 504, nearly a million dollars, four of them. And of course, micro loans, which are for much smaller amounts, came in at 213000 for um, the fiscal year. So uh, as they say, that ain't hay. Uh, that's, those are actually very good numbers. And those are up, um, those are up, not significantly, but they are up from, from the previous year. We really don't know, uh, none of us uh, are going to know the full effect uh, of COVID um, now. Uh, we have seen it, uh, but um, in terms of by the numbers, where are we going to be? You know, obviously we know that the pandemic has really affected um, accommodation and food services and arts and recreation. Those, those nationally were some of the hardest hit. And um, 
according to the U.S. Census Bureau, they do this pulse survey, you know, 34.2% of all businesses, now this is, this is from August when they asked this, you know, they reported being financially impacted. 71% um, of West Virginia businesses uh, were negatively reported that they were uh, negatively impacted by the pandemic and 40% and, uh, expected it to take six months or more uh, to be able to recover. Where we need to be is if we look at, well, okay. The largest structural change to the economy really has been that online activity. Uh, online retail spending, it typically rises about 1% every year. Uh, during the first quarter of 2020, this is, this is census era data, but according to the first quarter of 2020, we moved from 11.8 of all sales being online to 16.1. That means in one quarter, uh, uh, online retail sales jumped as much as it had in the previous four years. Now, we don't all engage in um, e-commerce per se, where you, know, you can buy something online, but I think we all know that uh, uh, having an online presence can make or break a business. Uh, there, um, I think there are 40,000 Google searches every seven seconds. So um, we know then based on these that, that support is still needed. And I would really be remiss if I didn't mention the, the West Virginia Small Business Development Center. They received significant COVID-19 response funds uh, to work one-on-one -on -one with small businesses. And uh, we have seen, and I think we're going to continue to see, their offerings and capabilities grow. So um, Sarah asked me when we originally talked about this to uh, uh, talk about businesses who've managed to pivot. And one of those has been uh, out of Parkersburg, West Virginia, Krennic Manufacturing, Doug Krennic. Uh, this company has been around since 1972. And they actually create uh, create specialty threads. Uh, some of their threads were used in um, uh, Game of Thrones uh, costumes. Um, and but it's a family owned business. And but they were impacted like everybody else originally, and they were able to access um, some of the PPP funds, particularly uh, working with West Banco. Uh, you know, because like everyone else in those early days, there was a complete shutdown. But he also started thinking about, well, he, it, it's interesting that um, masks were in high demand. We, we all know this, but there was a shortage of elastic. Uh, and Krennic, uh, Doug, remembered 35 years ago uh, that they had a machine uh, that he and his father had purchased. And they re he realized that, oh, I saw somebody making elastic with this machine. And so he and uh, a maintenance engineer kind of got to, got to experimenting and it actually worked. And so the business began producing uh, elastic on two machines. And he posted, uh, the, you're gonna see in front of you the, um, the picture that he posted on Facebook. Uh, and in no time he had, he, made, he had 150 orders and they received a large contract from the West Virginia National Guard for 11,000 yards of elastic. And uh, he has pivoted to that, uh, an elastic is now gonna be a regular uh, product, you know, produced by Krennic. And so they have eight machines running right now and they're gonna have to hire at least one additional employee. So this is uh, an idea of a, uh, of a business being able to see an opportunity um, and uh, to see a, a problem in the community in the marketplace that he could solve and he solved it and um, it is working out well for him so far. Now it's time for me to ask the big ask and I'm asking all of you as you meet small businesses across your communities, let them know the resources are here and they're here now. Um, this is a list of our local resource partners. There are others out there, but these are the, the official uh, SBA funded programs and um, you know, you can go to their websites, for example, wvsbdc.com, check out all their coaches, the new uh, NCIF Women's Business Center. SCORE has tremendous assets online at SCORE.org. And if you're a veteran and you're, you're transitioning from the military or you want to 
start your own business now or just grow that business. There's a Veterans Business Outreach Center. Uh, it, you'll be long distance, but I, it still has a number of capabilities that I think you'll find interesting. If you want to keep up uh, with what we're doing and what our resource partners are doing, we would encourage you to sign up for an email update. We don't spam. Uh, but uh, sba.gov slash updates, you put in your zip code and, and you'll get on the list to be uh, uh, to get the, the latest no news as we know it. And lastly, um, here are some of the upcoming sessions that we have. Uh, we're probably one of about five SBA um, state based offices that are offering um, regular in depth uh, paycheck protection program forgiveness training. Uh, it's it's in quite a bit demand right now. So uh, we would encourage you that if you have questions about that, or if you just have questions about anything, every Thursday uh, at, at, at noon, we do a Q&A with SBA where we have a government contracting specialist on, we have a lender specialist on, and me, and uh, we just answer any questions that you may have. So we would encourage you to check out the resources. That are there. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank the Alliance for Economic Development of Southern West Virginia, uh, Community Development Hub, and of course, Goldfield Development, and of course, uh, you, Brittany, and Sarah. Thank you so much, Kim. And uh, we have time for a couple questions. And one question came through, um, actually directed at all three of you the secretary, the director, and, and you, Kim. Um, could you, each one of you take this, and we'll start with Kim and then go to the secretary and then Director Graney. Um, what are the three sectors of growth that you see for West Virginia moving forward? Um, technical services, uh, I think is, is, is gonna continue to grow. Um, healthcare, even though we did have some healthcare losses, um, early during the pandemic. I, I'm not sure what was going on there. Uh, healthcare is gonna be another one. And honestly, um, recreation, tourism. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I, agree, I agree with Kim for sure, um, but I would add the uh, uh, aeronautics and space uh, uh, sectors. And I would add uh, a, 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 the downstream uh, uh, industries uh, related to uh, natural gas. So, Sarah, I agree with all of the above, but I would add um, the knowledge industries. And when I say the knowledge industries, I mean, back office support, cybersecurity, um, IT, um, DevOps development. Um, we've had a tremendous amount of growth in that, in that sector in the past five years in West Virginia, Morgantown, Fairmont, Bridgeport, um, and, and Charleston for that matter, and, and Huntington. I'll also tell you that I think um, entrepreneurship will, will continue to grow. And I think we'll, we'll see more people actually starting more businesses um, and, and, you know, it's sort of hard to, hard to, to, to develop an entrepreneur, you know, they, they naturally want to have to, you know, have, a, be very willing to take a great amount of risk and they need to be incredibly passionate and they need to have some fire in their belly. But I think we're going to see a number of folks, um, you know, continue to develop, um, entrepreneurial activities and, and growing small business. So Kim, thank you for all your support of those activities. And the SBDC is quite active in that. So there you go. And, and this question was asked, I believe, Senator Manchin, but I think it's um, very relevant for all of you as well. And we'll, at this time, we'll start with Director Graney and then go to Secretary and then Kim. Um, what can higher education do to support the development office, to support the SBA, support commerce, and, and grow jobs in West Virginia? What, what do you need from higher education? Great question. And, you know, for the first time in a long time, I think we have some great um, cooperation, collaboration from K through 12, the CTCs, and the four-year, um, you know, universities, four-year degree universities. Um, you know, the point really 
is, is that we're training students right now for jobs that we don't even know exist. And so we really need to be able to train them to be employable at whatever point they choose to, to drop out of the education system, whether it's in the 12th grade or whether they choose to go to the, you know, take advantage of West Virginia Invests and um, the CTCs, and then, you know, perhaps even go on um, to a four-year university. Really, I think we need to be creating programs that address jobs of the future. And um, I think we also obviously want to get the message to those students that, that there are jobs available for them in West Virginia. You know, um, obviously the CTCs work very closely with a number of employers throughout the state, and they're able to design curriculum for them very quickly. I'd like to see that kind of flexibility in the four-year university, to be frank. With you. So those are my thoughts. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've had the great privilege of being able to visit several of our, uh, uh, what do we call them now, career tech schools in the uh, K through 12 uh, arena. Uh, and, uh, and, and several of our, our CTCs and of course our four year institutions. Um, and I think truly, Sarah, this is one of the things that sets, sets us apart from many other uh, state economic development agencies, because Mike used the word nimble earlier, uh, and being nimble is really important. Uh, uh, you know, Hyperloop, uh, maybe I hope it hasn't been overused today, uh, but I can tell you uh, from the very beginning, we had, in terms of collaboration, we had everybody at the table, and that continued throughout this whole process to the announcement. Uh, and and just last Thursday or Friday, we had a we had somebody inquire about coming to West Virginia, which was a, kind of an unusual uh, uh, operation. But one of the things we told them was that we could go to a CTC, depending on what site they select, and we could have them develop a program specifically for them to train potential employees. Uh, and, and that was a great selling point. I could see they warmed up to that immediately. Uh, so, you know, uh, I said er another thing early on that we, we have to start teaching to the job in West Virginia. Now, uh, you know, liberal arts education is just fine uh, for the right person, but uh, we want people to, to finish their education at whatever point it is they, they decide to finish it and at that point be employable. Uh, that's, that's pretty simple, but uh, that's really kind of where we're headed and we get great cooperation. I mean, I can't say enough positive things about Dr. Sarah Tucker. Uh, anything we ask her to do, she's always ready to do it. Okay, my turn. Uh, <laughs> all of the above, but I'll tell you what, um, uh, my higher ed days are, are, are kind of long behind me, but I think that I would like to see students prepared to think about just not working for someone else, but to, to think about working for themselves, to think about um, innovating because their brains are already there. They're already aware of, of, of what's happening, uh, more so than I am. And the fact that if we could get them just a little better prepared ahead of time to be able to actually start their own businesses. And I think it would make for a, uh, for a stronger economy overall. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, and one final question that we, we will take on here is, in your experience, what is the hardest thing about opening a business? What is that one thing that most people struggle with? And we'll start uh, this time with uh, Secretary Dodge. Oh, you're muted. Very, I'll just try to be succinct on this and say capital, uh, adequate capital. Um, when I look at the reason, reasons businesses fail, uh, lack of capital is almost always at the top. Uh, and that's something that we need to work on as a state uh, and, and, and provide sources of capital. 
especially for these uh, entrepreneurs. Okay, thank you, Director Graney. Um, spot on. It's 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 always capital, in particular working capital, because you know I don't think anyone ever anticipates, you know, how their payables might get they, how they might have to stretch their payables or how their receivables get stretched without their control. So it's it's uh, it's 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 definitely capital, and and frankly, um, you know, we don't have as a state we don't have the resources to lend for working capital right now. Something that that I think needs to change. Thanks. Um, I I would agree because uh, we normally see I uh, can't remember what the statistic is, but about. 87%, I believe, uh, really start with money that they have saved, um, uh, pulling out some of their retirement or borrowing from friends and family. That's that's the vast majority of um, uh, funds that they are using. And you're right, working capital is critical. The other thing I, I think I would like to add is though, uh, the, the, that goes hand in glove with that and really needs to be addressed at the very beginning is um, uh, it, what problem are you solving? Uh, a very smart man told me, you know, uh, the basis of every business is you see a problem out there, you have a solution to that problem for a particular uh, target market, for a particular populace, and that populace has the money to spend uh, for that solution. And so I would like to see, um, I, I, I just think that th there needs to be a little more prep work for many small businesses uh, uh, in terms of when they get started, thinking through that that issue, and it, that's especially critical for many of our existing, uh, particularly family-based businesses. You know, how do they look at what they've always done in a different light, and 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 find that critical problem, and then um, find that that niche, that target market for them? Because we're an economy of not, uh, you're we're not marketing to the masses anymore. We really are marketing to these particular niches, and um, that's, I, I'd like better people to be better prepared for that. Well, thank you to all three of you for just a very great conversation, a 